when did you become interested in the Canadian Electronic Ensemble? Well, I should probably um, go back just a little bit and say, you know, why would I, a pianist, you know, who only was playing acoustic repertoire, why would I care about electronic music? <laughs> well, it started a little bit right at the end of my undergraduate. And, you know, I took one of those music since 1945 classes that I was required to take and heard, you know, this repertoire that I don't usually hear, um, that I wasn't, you know, wasn't playing in my studio, wasn't singing in the choir. Um, and I just love the timbres. I'm up, I, I, what I realized is that I'm obsessed with timbre. So like, give me an interesting, uh, give me an interesting sound. And then, and then after you've built an interesting sound, give me an interesting texture and I'm there. Um, and so, you know, I was tracking that like as a listener. And then when I did my, start my PhD, I decided to, to just talk about electronic and electroacoustic music. Um, but I was talking about studio based work more uh but i got to know david because i was um his daughter's roommate for a year and living basically a 20 minute walk north of them and so he was very gracious and they would host me because i was all the way from saskatchewan um and because he knew that my dissertation was on electronic music i mean i mean he could talk to me about all kinds of things that he was involved in but he he would he would hand me those topics, right? So interesting um, composers, if he'd heard their premieres, if he'd been recording their projects, and then also, of course, the CEE. So, um, you know, I wasn't talking about live electronic music at all in my dissertation. And so uh, I didn't really bring that in. And especially because I ended up focusing on recorded voice in studio-based music, and they don't really have a lot of that in their repertoire. But, you know, I'm hearing more, oh, we're doing this, we're doing that. And I was like, well, I'm going to go check them out. And of course, you go to a performance of the CEE and you just love it. I mean, it, I what I have found is like, you don't even have to turn into like the super fan that's going to seek out all of their recordings. But you just love that experience of being with them live and hearing, again, timbre, hearing these timbres swirl all around you and build and, and see the very subtle ways in which um they collaborate with each other in real time and you know they don't make a ton of eye contact but you know they're listening like you can sort of hear that in the way that they respond and so I was I was sold <laughs> and um and then I realized okay well there's this group that's been around for decades and uh no one's written about no one's writing about them in the scholarly record and that's something that has become very important to me as a musicologist as I am almost entirely devoted to living musicians because I sort of feel if someone in the time that it's happening isn't doing some of this work then so much of those stories and those records get lost um because there's only so much that you can go back and reclaim you know 100 years later 200 years later so I do feel a responsibility to um you know do some of that work as it's happening um and so then they were gracious enough to let me let me in, right? Let me sit in rehearsals, interviews, and I just have really enjoyed them as humans and as musicians. Um, so that's that's where where it started, and of course, then then they they've got me for life, right? <laughs> yeah, I've been fortunate to cross paths with a couple of the members over the years, and David Yeager in particular is an extraordinary, extraordinarily generous artist. I'm not at all surprised to hear that he was so supportive to you as a student and then later um, as an author. Um, for those who haven't had the opportunity, what's he like and, and why is he such an important figure? David specifically? I mean, well, David, I mean, he's just he's super, um, you know, kind and, and lovely, right? So, you know, right away, you know, I, I didn't know him, but because of this, you know, connection, which and it was actually a friend from my master's degree who knew them, who who knew that their daughter needed a roommate, you know, so there was a lot of, you know, connections that brought us together. I mean, just how generous is it to say there's this, you know, this uh, lonely PhD student far from family, like, like, let's just like, have her over for tea and let's have her over for meals. And um, both he and Sally are just extremely kind 
um, generous people in there. And well, Sally, his wife, is a storyteller, you know, by profession. Um, so we're not surprised there. But David also loves to tell stories, right? And he has been witness and been part of so many stories uh, around Canadian, you know, classical music making for, you know, you know, 50, <laughs> 50 years now. So it's just fun to sit down with him because he'll be like, oh, well, did I tell you about this? And it might be something that happened last week where he was part of an interesting recording session or or attended an interesting premiere or he'll or he'll go back into his own archive and pull back a story from 30 years ago where there was this interesting thing with our Marie Schaefer or whoever. Right. So he has um, he's worked with everybody in the Canadian classical music scene. You know, whether it's as a producer, you know, um, whether it was on the radio show, like two, um, two New Hours, or, or whether it was part of the CEE, because the CEE also commissioned a lot. They commissioned people, uh, and even if they didn't commission, if there was, you know, a piece that existed that could, you know, they could perform, they did that, or they also um, just merely presented a lot of musicians. So it wasn't necessarily the CEE. Uh, performing every single piece but it would be their concert series and so there would be pieces by you know a lot of guest musicians and guest composers so I mean he's he's seen so much he's led so much right um also I I don't want to get the exact detail wrong but he was you know the president of the international rostrum of, of composers and first Canadian to do so um so he's been a part of so much um, you know, and then beloved by basically, you know, every composer and performer, I think that he's, that he's worked with the way that I know that it's not that I've talked with every single one of them, but I see, I see how those relationships are maintained long term. And that to me is a sign that, that, that they have a good relationship with him as a producer, or as you know, you know, so you don't, you don't work with someone again unless it was good the first time. Why is the ensemble so uh, so greatly revered in new music circles? Why, why was it so important? Um, I think there's a, a few reasons. I mean, if we're thinking, if we're thinking at the time, and of course, I don't think that any group starts thinking, okay, well, we're going to do it for 50 years. They think we have something that we want to do now, right? And so if we're thinking about them in the sort of the 70s, they were doing things that were quite um, experimental and risky. I mean, we think about live electronic music. So electronic music making that's happening live in real time on a stage was still maybe only about a decade, not even a decade old when the CEE formed. And you might think, oh, well, so they weren't in the, they weren't in the first decade. Think about any practice. I mean, and it, it's less than a decade old. That's still very, very, very new. And then also what I saw as one of the kind of differences as opposed to maybe say like what Stockhausen was doing and things like that is they were trying to take the stuff that was in the studio that was really quite cumbersome and time consuming and, and really kind of designed for a different type of working situation and say, but no, this stuff makes really interesting sounds. We want to be able to make those sounds for an audience in real time. So I think they, they were on the leading edge of that, of bringing out that kind of equipment and trying, you know, and taking those risks because it wasn't really meant to be you know, done in real time and hearing a satisfying sonic result right that minute, right? The studio was a great place. It was a, like a safe place where, oh, well, that sounded terrible or that didn't work out the way I thought it would. We'll just start over again. No one will ever know kind of thing. And then, of course, <laughs> the other thing that makes them so important is, well, they kept at it. And so they have this history, this longevity it was basically on parallel. And what does that mean? What does it mean that they've been at it for so long? Well, that means they've seen it all in terms of new technologies. They've tried everything. For some of them, they've come back to some of those older uh, modular, actual anal analog modular synthesizers. You know, someone like David, he likes um, to stick with his with his laptop and his um you know, his softwares that he that he likes. And so they but they've seen all those changes and something new would come out and they would often 
buy it. Now, they'll talk also, not always, because that's a lot of money and they were young. And um, But, you know, so they were trying things out when things were being released. And, the, and multiple times they have said, like, that all of them would be inspired by to write a new piece because of a new technological possibility, right? So that repertoire is also tracking these changes as they're happening, which is, I think, really wonderful. And, you know, you um, you mentioned how, um, you know, their their music is sort of timeless. It is both timeless in that I think it's, I think everything they did from the 70s until now is still wonderful to listen to and yet it also speaks to the moment of creation right like you hear certain kinds of timbres certain gestures that are coming out of the specificities of their gear that is kind of cool if you can lock into that or like those moments where you're like oh okay I hear that or that kind of sound oh that's so 70s or that's so early 80s but it's still in this kind of larger uh, conceptual practice and aesthetic that I think is still really fun to listen to. There's a tendency, um, yeah. Sorry, there's a tendency among a lot of electronic fans, electronic music fans, to focus on what's new. Mm. I think too seldom um, th they look back and they appreciate the history. Uh, why is the ensemble worth more young people's attention? Um, I mean, the, this very simple answer is, well, I just think it sounds good. I mean, I think it just sounds interesting. And so, and you'll, you know, you're not going to find something that sounds like the CE. I mean, they, they sound like them and they're, they have influences, right? Like you can hear, you can hear traces of their influences, but they sound like them. And so if you haven't listened to them, if you haven't listened to the CE, then then you are sort of missing out on this on this very specific kind of practice and sound and um, collaboration and the improvisation, right? The improvisation stuff came a little bit more later, but basically everything that you might listen to from the last 20, 25 years is almost predominantly all um, improvised. And I think that that's also an extremely valuable thing to kind of, immerse your ears in um why why should they give a listen I mean that you're asking a musicologist who like is always saying well ground everything you're thinking about in history but I just think that the music is still interesting and it tells us something about how you know electronic music has changed and developed but also what are some creative principles that transcend gear I think that's something I really appreciate about the CE is like, yeah, they like to experiment. Oh, this thing can do this one specific thing or it has this this capability. But they're always sort of thinking at a level above that, like, which is sort of, you know, kind of a sonic concept, right? Because sometimes something won't work. And so you can't be after that very specific thing that you want because it might not work. <laughs> that might not happen to Or especially in improvisation, you might think you're going to try that but your but your you know your fellow musician takes it in another direction and you have to be able to respond so there has to be some other kind of musical ideas that are guiding you and so i think that's another thing that musicians can learn from the cee is thinking about what are the musical ideas what are the sonic ideas actually being explored here through the technology but almost sometimes despite the specific technology there was a kind of gravity to their decisions all along the way, too, I think, that, you know, with the classical training that they had, um, their approach to composed pieces really showed how big, how intricate electronic music could be. And as you say, more recently in the improvisational world, really extending those techniques in a very interesting way. I think anyone who cares about how electronic music can be more is going to find an awful lot in this disc discography. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think they're going to find a lot about how to how to work with other musicians, right? Like, how do you leave space for multiple voices in a collaboration, whether it's composed or not, right? Because if we think about a lot of their early stuff, it was composed. 
and it was often, you know, featuring someone, but not, but not always. And so how have they written material in which everyone, everyone is given an opportunity, right? So thinking a lot about kind of structure and textures and, and voices, I think there's a lot of lessons that, that other musicians can, can learn. You know, it's not about, again, that wouldn't be about imitating it, but saying, how, how do I want to think about this idea in my practice? How, what would it mean to sort of Ha, open up a moment for like a solo you know what would it mean or what would it mean to to give space for someone to be virtuosic in this moment or what would it mean for us to like create a moment of collective cacophony like to sort of think how would I apply that in my practice given that I just heard that um and I mean I think to me that's a sign again of like how how wonderful they are as a group is all of the soloists guest soloists who loved to work with them like did you know multiple you know sometimes multiple pieces with them or going on tours with them again you don't do that unless you like working with them unless personally and musically there you find that satisfying right um curious about your experience writing the book was it was it a difficult book to write <laughs> Um, well, writing a book is difficult, <laughs> but um, in many ways, no, because the CE has been so generous to me, like all of the members have been so generous in, in giving me time, you know, to interview them, to have, well, multiple interviews <laughs> uh, with them, you know, follow-up emails. Oh, can you clarify this? Can you confirm this? You know, so they gave so much of their time um and having this abundance of material from performances I've attended rehearsals that they allowed me to attend um you know them coming to CMU for those five days also just really provided an abundance of, of material for me to think through uh, whether it was them talking to students and doing workshops or they gave a public talk there was just so much there that um and it not only was there an abundance of material, but it also was really motivating for me to be like, yes, like there's so much here in this story and in their practice. And there's there's just so much history and, um, you know, present, present, <laughs> right? There's so much happening now that they're still doing. So in that way, uh, it wasn't difficult. I would say um, there's a couple things, you know, are, are tricky in a project like this in that, it was clear because I've I have had such amazing access to part of their history, how amazing it would be if it, if I had been able to be firsthand to more of it, you know, if somehow magically I was older and had been alive or like time travel. I mean, that would be amazing, right? To be able to put myself back in the 70s and in these key moments. So that, you know, that's a little bit difficult of a thing to be like, well. I'm so drawn to these moments that I was able to witness firsthand, but there's so much other other parts of the history. And then I would say um, the fact that I didn't start researching the CE until after um, Larry Lake's passing was also, you know, kind of a difficult thing because you know he's a he was a founding member, um, and and everything from what I've heard, like such a force, right? I just know I would have had the most amazing. Um, stories from him and you know he is everywhere in this book and I think his personality really comes through but it that's that's I mean it's the the loss to my book of course is the most minor thing given you know the, the loss of Larry Lake to his whole you know community um, it's, just, it's just unfortunate again it's like if I had been a different sort of different person different age different place in like if I had been able to start you know 10 years earlier for example um, it would have just been really amazing to have Larry be a part of it directly 